Well, hello, Woodman. Let's go, right? Are you ready? A new year is upon us. And to kick us off, I've got 10 things for you. Why 10, you ask? Well, that leads me to a first one. This weekend, we are beginning a new series, 10 Words to Live By, looking at the 10 Commandments. And I hope you make it a priority to be with us each and every week. Two, third Thursday, are you a 20-something person? Are you looking for an opportunity to worship, learn from God's Word, and meet others who are like you? Third Thursday, awesome opportunity for just that to happen. When is it, you ask? The third Thursday of the month. Also, three, we got Everyday Jesus coming up. Are you looking to share the gospel in the context in which you are? You work in the medical field. Oh, you're a salesperson. You work in a shop. Everyday Jesus brings some practical content to bear so that you can be more effective in sharing your faith. That is coming up. Sign up today. Oh, but you're saying, I, I, I want to do more than just like a one-time seminar kind of day thing. Boom! Four community groups. Not too late for you to get involved. Do life with other followers of Christ. Maybe that was your takeaway from last weekend. Now's the time to sign up for also five Woodman U. Opportunity to grow, to learn, and to be cared for. Uh, maybe there is an area of your life that needs a little shining. Maybe there's an area that you want to understand more of. This is the chance for you. Six, have you thought about travel recently? Uh, maybe not. It's been a nutty time for just that. But you know what? We've been given a commission to go into all the world and share the gospel. And our hope and our prayer is that God is going to allow us to do that. And we would love to have you be a part of one of our global trips in 2022-23. Uh, I know you're saying it might not happen. It might not. But if it does, we want men and women ready to go. Is that the one for you? Number seven. What about our younger set, students? Did your parents get you camp for Christmas? Did they? Oh, they didn't? I'm sorry, we still have space and you can go. And if you need help to make that happen, you let us know. We would love to see every middle school student, every high school student involved at winter camp this year. Here's number eight. We have a new app coming out. Speaking of the students, we're getting all techie. A greater way for you to be connecting with the ministry of Woodman in your daily life. I'm super pumped about this one, and I want you to keep your eyes out, and I want you to be one of those early adopters and get on the program when it comes out. Nine, the app would actually help with this. It's the beginning of the new year. Do you need to kind of evaluate, maybe pull the budget together and consider what it is you're contributing financially to the work of the Lord at Woodman? Uh, this would be a sweet time to set aside in advance what you endeavor to give to support the work of ministry here. The app will help you do that, but you can go to our website right now, sign up for online giving and make just that happen. And drum roll please, number 10. Here's the great news. You've already done it. You've chosen to join us this day. We are so grateful for the people that make up Woodman Valley Chapel. And if you are visiting with us, you are welcomed here. Uh, for all of us, we'd love you to check our online service guide out. And if you are new, or even if you've got a ton of questions, go to Connect Central after this service and let us know you were here and let us know how we can help you. But now we turn to worship, lifting high the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Father in heaven, from whom all good things come down, and his spirit that lives inside of us to empower our worship now. Let's sing. Yes, uh, I want to also extend a welcome. My name is Brian. I'm so glad you were here on this rather chilly and I know it was snowing. Maybe it's not snowing anymore. But we are glad you're here. God is moving in this place. And I want to open our time together 
the call to worship from reading, reading from Psalm 63. So if, if you're able to stand, will you stand as I read this? You have to put these bad boys on. <clears throat> the Psalm of David from the wilderness. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. So let's do that together. Let's bring our praise before the Lord as we sing.
let's continue to just bring our praise before our Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus. I call you maker. You give life an eternal spark. I call you healer. You can mend any broken heart. I call you faithful father. You finish everything you start. My soul was made to respond. I know you by a thousand names, and you deserve every single one. You've given me a million ways to be amazed in what you've done.
Bless my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah Yes, Lord, for all our days here, may these words be true of our heart, our soul, our mind, our actions, Lord, while we are here on this earth, that we praise your name. All the names that you are, God, all that you are to us, may we glorify you. God, help us 
in doing so. As we walk each day, help us to know how to live to glorify you. Because that's our goal. That's what we want to do, Father. And as we sit here tonight, Lord, may our, our hearts and our ears be open for walking in angry, disturbed about something, Lord, take that away because we know you can. Help us to focus solely on you and to listen for what you have for us. We love you, Father, and we love how you can speak to us. May we listen and glorify you, God. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Well, hello, Woodman. If you are new or visiting with us, my name is Josh, one of the pastors here. And if you've been here a ton, thank you for being with us today. Uh, this weekend, we're going to begin a new series entitled 10 Words to Live By. And we're going to be looking at what we commonly call uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, but in Hebrew, was simply referred to as the words, the ten words. Now, whatever you call them, uh, they were the core expectations. Uh, this is what God desired from his people, the Israelites. Much like a young couple sometimes kind of gets to that point where they have to have the talk, the DTR, and just really define the relationship, God's the one that takes the initiative. After he has delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, brought them to the base of Mount Sinai, he gives them his law. Uh, the ten words or commandments become for the Israelites uh, kind of like our constitution. It does not address everything that, that will need to be said, but it's foundational for all that will be said after it. Now, if you're new to church stuff, or, or even if you've been around for a while, uh, when you start talking about God issuing commandments or having expectations for us, some people start rolling their eyes. Uh, people chafe, some people, some people chafe at the idea of God telling them what to do, which is a little funny because we don't always do that in other areas of our life. To the contrary, we often appreciate some formal expectations in other relationships, don't we? I mean, you like to know what that prospective employer plans on paying you before you take the job. Uh, you, you like knowing uh, that your husband or wife really is not going to date other people once you get married. And, I mean, if you hire a painter to paint your living room, Benjamin Moore 1072, and you find him in your kitchen with cans of flat black, that's not good. We like to have some expectations and some formality into relationships. But the other thing that I find somewhat ironic about the subject is that often those who chafe at God having expectations of them, they see no inconsistency in them having expectations of God. 
And you, you just can't have it both ways. Uh, Jesus invites you and I to have a relationship with him. And, it, and if you don't like the terms of that relationship, you, you can decline. But, but if you want the, the benefits of that relationship, uh, he, he calls us to follow him. Follow him in the way that he defines it. Uh, these 10, these 10 words, um, they, they, they have Jesus' heart. He, he's a fan of them. And so as we study, uh, my prayer is that we'll, we'll see his heart in it and seek to knit ours, change ours, divert ours if, if we're not in the same place. So if you would, let's pray and we're going to open up God's word. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to gather I thank you, God, that you have laid out your word. I thank you, God, that you have our best in mind. Lord, I pray uh, not just for today, but in the weeks ahead, that if we come upon an, an area of a discrepancy, I pray that you'd humble us, that we would see it your way and get on board. God, I pray that you would meet with us now. I pray that you'd help me not to make any mistakes. Be glorified as we study your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, uh, turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And we actually studied Exodus 19 uh, in in the late fall of, of last year. And God had dramatically rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. He provided for their every single step and then led them to the base of Mount Sinai. And God was going to descend upon that mountain and and the people had to get ready. It was actually kind of terrifying. There was thunder, lightning, lots of smoke. There was trumpet blasts and earthquakes. It was a scene. And God wasn't being dramatic. It's just who he is. And he was coming down. And into all of it, uh, God called Moses, the leader of the Israelites, to come on up into the thick of it so he could speak with him. And Moses went, and this is what happened next. God spoke. Look at verse 1 and and just verse 1. It said, and God spoke all these words saying, just, just press pause right there. <laughs> this is actually pretty big. And, and if you've read beyond in the Bible, maybe not so much because you've read other stuff, but up until this point, uh, God's voice had really been limited to a very actually small audience. Adam and Eve got to hear him. Noah Abraham, the rest of the patriarchs. Moses got to hear the voice of God at the burning bush. But now, everybody did. All of Israel heard the voice of God coming down to them. And if you fast forward in chapter 20, just down to verse 18, it says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, and then here it is, You, you Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. The voice of God was a lot for them to take in. Now many times, many times in the future from this point, prophets would come and say, Prophets would come to the Israelites and say, thus says the Lord. But on this day, there was no intermediary. They heard God's voice themselves. And it was terrifying. And and, and I think it's significant. Imagine having a paper due tomorrow and, and, and it's not done. And so you're making plans, good job coming out, but you're making plans, all-nighter, you're going you're gonna to get this thing done. And, and then someone, classmate says, what are, you, what are you doing? I'm trying to finish that paper. Oh, oh didn't you hear? The professor said, we, we have another week. Good news, I mean, if the professor said that, 
You're, you're going to want to confirm that that is actually what the professor said before you take dude's word for it. And the same thing I think is true here for the Israelites. Not that God's future words through prophets were not binding, but these 10 words, there's no excuse, there's no go between. They heard God himself say it. Which, to put it lightly, I mean, with all the fanfare that preceded it, God's own voice delivering them. These 10 words matter. But to be clear, these 10 words mattered different to the Israelites than they do to us today. For them, for the Israelites, these 10 words became the foundation of the covenant God made between them. Now these, th- these words, this is the constitution, the foundation of the covenant God was making between himself and, and the people of Israel. You and I, you and I living on this side of the cross, we have a better option. We, we, have, a, we have a new and better covenant, which if, if you can in a message, we're, we're going to do a little sidebar and, and, and talk about the relationship between the Old Testament law and us. And it's maybe something you don't think about all the time, but as we're going to be unpacking these Ten Commandments, I think it's important for us to understand. And for that, New Testament, Romans chapter 10, verse 4. It says this. It says, For the Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That is, Jesus is both the, the, he's the fulfillment and the hope. He, he, he's the end and all the Old Testament law. All the Old Testament looked forward to. He is the end of the Mosaic law. As such, the Old Testament law is no longer binding on us, which is why we can go and eat bacon-wrapped shrimp. We can do that because we are not under the Mosaic law. Awesome, because shrimp are so tasty. Now, if you go to Romans 3... Romans 3, 21 and 22 tells us the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God, my words, is found through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Uh, If you'll forgive the overly simplistic illustration, it's kind of like the updates Apple pushes out for your phone. Now, my wife never, never, does them, and, and then does wonder why things don't work. And I get to look like a tech genius. You get these, these updates, and, and some are incremental, but some are big. And, and there's some that once you go to it, there's no going back. You, you, you cannot go back. This, this is what happened when Jesus Christ came. Uh, God's covenant with Israel, that law that you find in the Old Testament, was replaced by the coming of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament law for us is now obsolete. Today, your only option, your only option for a relationship with God is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven by which people can be saved. That is it. Which, I mean, if you can do a sidebar within a sidebar, is actually a way better option, a way better plan than what they had. Ephesians 2.8 says, it's by grace that we have been saved. And it's not your own doing. It's a gift of God. We are saved through grace, which is not why none of us can be boasting 
about how awesome we are at this. Jesus Christ came to this earth and he kept the Old Testament law that we couldn't keep. All those laws, when you go through the litany of them and you think 613, man, that's a lot. Jesus never failed on one. Jesus kept the Old Testament law we couldn't keep. And then Jesus died the death we deserve for not keeping it. Jesus kept it perfectly. And then he died for us who didn't. That's why Romans 8.1 is so profound. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is, this is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, you can have relationship with God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The bad news, if you could say it that way, bad news is there is no other option. This, this is it. It's, it's a gift of grace, so you need bring nothing to the table, but there's no other place that you can go. Have you... Have you chosen Jesus? Have you recognized him for who he is? Believed him in what he says about you? And received the forgiveness for the sins that you have committed and the life that you cannot lead and received his mercy for it. That is our option today. So, assuming, assuming we've all done that then, which would be awesome, the question becomes, what, if any, purpose does the Old Testament law have in our lives? Now, an overly simplistic answer, uh, in one way, could be none. We are not bound to the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. We're not. Instead, we need to get on the program of the new covenant and confess Christ as Lord. That, that's the covenant we have option to sign up for. But, as Romans 3, as we read 21, told us, even in the old covenant, the law and the prophets bear witness to the new one. The Old Testament looked forward to the new covenant. The, the Old Testament finds, we find in Christ the fulfillment of all it had hoped for. So when Jesus says the two greatest commandments are to love God and to love others, and he says that the entire Old Testament can be summed up by those two commandments, Jesus is about them. Jesus thinks those are the greatest commandments, that we should love God and love others. And then he says, you know what? They actually sum up the Old Testament. So if you and I, following after Jesus Christ, want to know what it looks like to love God and love others, the Old Testament gives us a pretty good picture of how to do that. Knowing the Old Testament law helps us to understand how to do those things which is why the Apostle Paul writing in 2 Timothy 3.16 can say all Scripture, all of it, all Scripture is profitable, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The Old Testament is not binding on us today, but it is profitable if you're here and you want to live the Christian life. It gives us a picture. It gives us concrete examples of how you and I can do that. And so while the Old Testament is not binding on us, Jesus and the New Testament does restate a lot of what it calls for. Nine out of the Ten Commandments we're going to look at are explicitly restated by Jesus. So, so, so they're binding they, they become 
binding for us. It's safe to say that Jesus, Jesus is a fan. Now, at the end of the day, binding or not, these are still words that God, our Heavenly Father, spoke. And because the Old Testament is filled with the very words of God, you, you would think that we, we'd be interested in hearing those. You know, growing up in a Canadian home, like a lot of you know I did, you don't wear your shoes in the house. You just don't do it. And if I tried to wear snowy boots into the family room, my mom would, the boots are off. I'm not wearing those boots. Now, I no longer live in Canada. And what does bring me joy to say, Mom, I'm not under your authority anymore. <laughs> but you know, when I go home, I, I still take them off. Could I kind of claim... It's not what we do in America. Could I say, Mom, you're not the boss of me? <laughs> Both those are true. But I know her heart. And though it's not binding, I'm, I'm, I still I want to abide by that. We're not bound by the Old Testament law. But it does give us insight into how our Heavenly Father feels so for that alone, it does in a real way matter. Do you care? Do you care what your heavenly father thinks? Does it matter to you? And I will concede, you can get into some of those laws. You're, you're like mid-Leviticus, and it's just, it's a lot. And it's easy to turn the pages faster or, or to scroll a little quicker. But I'd encourage you to, 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 to slow down and to hear why, why is it that God would be asking his nation to do this? And how is it that what God is asking his nation to do can be summed up by loving him or loving others? Like Jesus said. Now, in either case, in either covenant, the old or the new, both the old and the New Testament covenants begin with grace. Both begin with grace. Look at verse 2 in Exodus chapter 20. We're moving super fast. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, we often refer to it as the Old Testament law, but it really was a treaty. It was a covenant made between God and his people. And unsurprisingly, when God made the treaty with his people, he actually followed, God embraced, God used the treaty-making conventions of their day. He wanted the Israelites to recognize this as, as like a legal treaty, like other covenants they had seen. Now, most covenants back then began with a preamble and then like a prologue. The preamble identified the different parties in the agreement, and then the prologue explained how the parties came to be related. And in both the Old and the New Testaments, it began with grace. The preamble here, he says, the Lord, God, and you, the Israelites. Uh, those are the parties in this covenant. That's why we're not a part of it. It, it. it was God and the Israelites. And then how they came to be related, the prologue, I rescued you. That's how we came to be related. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Before God, before God had any expectations of them, he demonstrated his love for them in while they were yet still enslaved and doing nothing for him. He rescued them. And similarly, before God had any expectations of us, we were not even alive. He demonstrated his love for us 
in that while we were yet still sinners, he sent his son Jesus to die for us. Neither the Israelites or us earn his affection through our behavior. The Israelites were not going to stick to this law to get his grace and mercy. He had already demonstrated his grace and mercy by rescuing them. It's similar, if you will, to like how a parent feels about like an infant newborn. They love him. They love her. And they do nothing. They bring nothing. They made mom miserable, literally, Cost both mom and dad money, but they they protect, they care, they should feed, they should love. And they do that first, before the child responds in any way. But when that child grows up, even if mom and dad, and some of you have been in this spot, even if mom and dad do all that they can and love them dearly, there comes a point when the child has a choice. And they can either continue to receive in that love and take their shoes off when they go home and do the stuff that's expected around the place, or they can say, no, thank you, and they can walk. One of the tragic mistakes... One of the tragic mistakes people make is is equating the Old Testament with law and the New Testament with grace. Both, both began with grace and both have formal expectations for the recipients of the grace that's been given. Both do. We show our love and our gratitude for the grace he has demonstrated by seeking to be obedient to the things he asks of us. There are formal expectations for sure in the Christian life. There are things that Christ asks of us. But before he asked a thing, he demonstrated his love for you and for me by dying on the cross. Are you, are you chafing at some of his expectations? Do you not like some of the things he's called you to do? And let me just be blunt. Is that fair? Is that fair of us? I mean, if you are an employer and an employee does not want to do the job you hired them for and you've paid them to do, is that your fault? Our obedience to what he calls us to is our response to his free gift of grace. Is there an area in your life that you would like to bring a little more in line with what Jesus has asked of you because of what Jesus has already done for you. To do these things, not because you're required to, but because your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is asking you to follow him. And he's asking you to follow him on a certain path. Uh, This this is the setup. Now we come to the first. This is the first word, the first commandment. Verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Short and sweet. (laughs) And to the point. Which will have a little tiny sidebar. They viewed laws differently than us back then. In in the Old Testament, their their concept 
of, of the legal system was way different. Ours is like an exhaustive law code. We actually have the, the case, and maybe you've been on the wrong side of this, and it's awful, where there is a criminal. They've done it. Everybody knows. Everybody knows, but they get off on a technicality. That wasn't even an option in the Old Testament. They didn't have a category for it. They viewed Old Testament law differently. These 10 words and all that followed operated more like when a parent says, don't draw on the walls. Okay, no, no drawing on the walls. But then mom comes in the next room and, and Jimmy's drawing on the floor. Now, who here thinks Jimmy has a legit defense if he says, mom, you said no drawing on the walls. You should be a little more specific next time. Right? Does that, does anyone think that'll fly? No. They looked at laws back then the same way. Uh, so even though Exodus 22, Exodus 22, 1 says that restitution needs to be made for stolen oxen and sheep. If you steal an oxen or a sheep, you need to make restitution. Nobody thought that meant, well, we should steal his goat. Nobody thought that. And if, and if someone did, and then they're before the judge, and they're like, no, 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 it just says, it says sheep and oxen. It's like, you're an idiot. You know what we meant. That's how they looked at Old Testament laws. So don't ever be kind of sideswiped by, by like, some of these are short. Some of these are very specific. It's because we look at them like, well, there's a lot of leeway there. No, 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 no. They look at it like it's, it, it's making a point. So if you can't steal the ox and you can't steal the sheep, that means leave his kangaroo, don't take the cat, anything. You're not supposed to steal other people's stuff. So the first commandment may be short and sweet. You shall have no other gods before me. But it's actually quite broad in its application. Now, the words before me literally means, literally means to my face or before my face. So if you're looking at it our way, you would think, oh, God's just saying I can't bring another God before him when I worship. One, there's that other part. He's omnipresent, so he's everywhere, so that wouldn't fly. But two, everybody recognized what God was calling for. You can't have any other gods beside me ever. It's kind of like when the preacher asks the groom, will you have this woman to be your wedded wife? Like not just when she's in the room. Like at, at all times. You guys, we, we understand that. What we can gloss over is for the Israelites... This was saying something. They had just spent some 400 years living in a thoroughly pluralistic culture. Egypt had different gods for different things over different places. And most people had multiples. They picked and choose depending on what they needed, what they were going through. They lived in that. And now God, first thing... It's just me. And some historians, biblical commentators, can't say it for certain, but they, a lot of people are like, this is actually the first time in history that we have a deity saying that. Oh, in Egypt, there was no God being like, no, 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 I'm raw. It should just be me. No, they were all cool with like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we're all here. No, no, no. But God, God's the one who says, no, 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 no. It is going to be me, just me, and me alone. God demanded fidelity. Not surprisingly, this is one that Jesus explicitly backed up. Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And just like, just like his heavenly father, Jesus is really adamant on this point. 
Uh, have you ever read in Luke 18, and if you haven't, a man comes to Jesus, and he, and he asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, he's awesome with people. He plays it cool. And so Jesus starts kind of rattling off some of the ten. Some of the Ten Commandments. He just starts throwing, throwing some out. And this guy, which I would think it took some moxie, looks Jesus straight faced and says, Awesome. I've done that. Done them all. Remarkably, Jesus doesn't correct him. Almost like Jesus is like, Oh, yes. But then Jesus says, One thing you lack go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And the man says, no. And it says Jesus was sad. And Jesus let him go. We can have no other gods in him. Jesus plus anything is is no longer the gospel. You probably uh, do not have a little shrine in your living room to some other deity that you make offerings to. There's, there's a not a lot of us who would be here and, and are also double dipping with, with some other false god. But that unfortunately does not mean That God or his son, Jesus Christ, is the only one in our heart. Obviously, the money one's pretty, pretty profound in our day. And there, there actually is a host of things that might not be recognized as deities as such. But things that take our heart away from him and what's perhaps... Most tragic of all, we have no problem bringing them before him, even as we worship. Some of us probably are worshiping other gods too. Are you one of those people? And, and, and do you want, do you want to be all in? And what would it look like for this year for you to make a commitment that does just say, that first one, I'm doing it. No other gods. It's you and you alone. Forgive me for the times I've drifted. Forgive me for those times I've swayed. I've seen it. I recognize it. I don't want it. What would change? How much would change? And and what might it look like to commit to him afresh? Uh, Jesus Christ asks us to follow him and him alone. It's the first of the ten. And some people never get further. Now, one of the things that we're going to do during this entire series of the 10 words is, is, is that give, we're going we're gonna to give just a moment of reflection afterwards uh, for you to consider, is, is this word a problem for you? Now, I'd like to think that for a lot of us, we're like, okay, great week to come. I'm all in on Jesus. No problem. It won't be so easy in subsequent weeks. And even if you think you're doing awesome, I would invite you to take this moment of reflection and be praying because this one is not easy for some people who are here. It's easy to say that I'm following after Jesus, but I'm, I'm also going to make sure that like my work thing is amazing. It's easy to say I'm going to follow after Jesus, but then to have a sneaky little habit that I do when everyone else is in bed. It's easy to follow after Jesus and to depend on other things that aren't him. It's so easy to say we're following Jesus plus something else. And so let's start this year off getting this first one right.
and then we'll sing together. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am, uh, I am so thankful that we are not under that old covenant with all of the rules and all of the stipulations and so hard to keep track of. But Father, I, I can sin without any of them. And I pray, God, that you would, in my own life, be truly just the center of it all. Be the thing that I value the most. And I suspect some of us here would want to say the same. God, we want to love you with all of our hearts, our soul, our mind, our strength. And when we are drifting from that, Lord, gently lead us home. Meet with us now as we just reflect. Ask ourselves, is, is, this, is this a word that I need to hear? And give us the courage to respond. In your son's name, amen. stand as we continue to sing this stanza.
Amen. And it is the Lord who saves every single one of us in this room. We are in need of salvation. We are in need of a Savior. And perhaps you're, you're here this evening and you fully recognize that and you have run to and you are clinging to Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. Perhaps though you're here and the Holy Spirit has, has convicted, has reminded you that, that you're looking to something else. You're looking to a, a, a Jesus plus and it's coming up empty. And today, tonight, you need to confess that and say, no, it's Christ and Christ alone is the one who saves. Perhaps you're here and you, you need prayer. You need encouragement. You need people to rally behind you, beside you for, for any reason. We're going to have pastors. We're going to have leaders. You're going to be up front. We'd love to pray with you. And if we can help get you connected in to community here at the church, swing by Connect Central. Let us seek after our Lord, the one who saves with fervor this year. But as you go into your Saturday night, let me read these words over you this evening. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time. And now and forever, amen. Go in his grace and go in his peace.